Hello and welcome to the second part of the brachial plexus anatomy. We will be learning the relations of its various parts, the 11 side branches and 5 terminal branches in detail with their root values and sensory motor supply that covers almost the entire upper limb, further applied and clinical anatomy and the topographical anatomy of the trunks and terminal branches. Hi, I am Dave from Plaricon. In part 1, we saw how to draw a brachial plexus quickly, its various parts, its structural anatomy, its various classifications, its origin and detail, and the myotomes and dermatomes of the upper limb. You can find the link to the video here. Let's begin with the relations of the roots. Anteriorly the scalenus anterior, posteriorly the scalenus medius, and inferiorly the first rib form the interscaline triangle through which the roots, the subclavian artery, and the phrenic nerve traverses. Let's have a closer look. Here is the scalenus anterior, the scalenus medius and in between is the interscalene triangle through which passes the roots of the brachial plexus, the subclavian artery inferiorly and the phrenic nerve superiorly. In this triangle, the interscalene block is given mainly to the upper roots of the brachial plexus. The sternocleidomastoid anteriorly, the trapezius posteriorly and the clavicle inferiorly form the posterior triangle of the neck which is joined into upper occipital and lower subclavian triangles by the inferior belly of homohyoid. The accessory spinal nerve after supplying the SCM traverses the occipital triangle and supplies the trapezius. It's a donor brachial plexus nerve. The transverse cervical artery traverses the subclavian triangle and supplies the trapezius. The inferior belly of homohyoid inserts close to the suprascapular notch. Hence, traction on it helps identify the notch and the corresponding nerve. Also note, anterior to the scalenus anterior is the subclavian vein, while posterior to the scalenus medius are the two branches from the root, that is long thoracic nerve and dorsal scapular nerve. Now let's look into these two side branches of the roots in further details. They both supply muscles which act on the medial border of the scapula. The first branch of the brachial plexus is dorsal scapular nerve which originates from the C5 nerve root. It supplies the levator scapula which elevates the scapula and the rhomboidus minor and major which retracts and medially rotates the scapula can be remembered by R for R. The second side branch is the long thoracic nerve or the nerve of Bell which originates from the C5, C6, C7 nerve roots and it supplies the serratus anterior which protracts and stabilizes the scapula. So in serratus palsy, the winging of the scapula is due to the unopposed retraction by the rhomboids. Next comes the trunks which line the lower subclavian part of the posterior triangle of the neck that I just described. Moving on to the topographical anatomy of the upper trunk, the well-defined suprascapular nerve fascicles lie laterally, just medial to it are the axillary nerve fascicles, in the middle are the musculocutaneous nerve fascicles and medial most are the sensory nerve fascicles from C5, C6 roots. In the middle trunk, supermedially lies the lateral pectoral nerve fascicles which also serve as donors and inferiorly fascicles to triceps. Let's move on to the side branches of the upper trunk. The nerve to subclavius is sometimes considered as a branch from C5 C6 nerve root rather than the upper trunk. It supplies the subclavius which stabilizes the clavicle during the movement of the shoulder and arm. The next side branch, which is the suprascapular nerve, is a mixed nerve as we saw in the previous video. The suprascapular nerve acts on the shoulder joint by supplying the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles, both of which insert onto the greater tubercle of the humerus. The supraspinatus initiates the abduction of the shoulder, which is the first 15 degrees, while infraspinatus is special as it externally rotates the shoulder. Only two other muscles help in external rotation, one being teres minor and the other the posterior fibers of deltoid. Suprascapular nerve being a mixed nerve also supplies sensory fibers to the acromioclavicular and the glenohumeral joints. Now let's look into the clinical relevance of divisions. In the previous video we saw that the divisions lie in the infraclavicular region. Anatomically, the upper limb can be divided coronally into anterior blue and posterior yellow being supplied by anterior and posterior divisions respectively. Clinically, the anterior divisions are responsible for adduction, flexion and internal rotation at the shoulder joint, flexion at the elbow, wrist and fingers, pronation at the forearm and all the intrinsic hand functions. On the other hand, the muscles supplied by the posterior divisions are responsible for abduction, extension and external rotation of the arm, 
extension at elbow, wrist and fingers and supination at the forearm. Now let's look into the relations of the cord. We have already seen in the previous video how lateral, medial and posterior cords are named and related to the axillary artery. The cords are located in a triangular infraclavicular space lateral to the deltopectoral groove which is also called Chuang's triangle. As we dissect deeper through the deltopectoral groove, we will find the pectoralis minor muscle under which we will first see the medial cord. Moving on to the seven side branches from the cords. The lateral pectoral nerve is the only side branch from the lateral cord. It traverses medially, gives off a communication to the medial pectoral nerve and continues further to supply the clavicular and sternal portions of the pectoralis major muscle. It originates from the upper or rather laterally placed C5, C6, C7 nerve roots. The clavicular origin part of the pectoralis major attaches distally on the lateral lip of the bicipital groove and flexes the arm whereas the sternal origin part attaches proximally and extends the arm. Both parts adduct and internally rotate the shoulder as muscles supplied by the anterior divisions. The medial pectoral nerve is the first side branch of the medial cord which supplies the pectoralis minor and also the sternal portion of the pectoralis major. It originates from the lower C8 T1 nerve roots. This is followed by two cutaneous or sensory side branches from the medial cord. The first supplies the medial portion of the proximal arm and the second the medial portion of the distal forearm. From the previous video, we know that the dermatomal mapping of the medial portion of the forearm is C8 and arm is T1. Similarly, the posterior cord also has three side branches, namely the upper, middle and lower subscapular nerves. The upper and lower subscapular nerve supplies the upper and lower portion of the subscapularis respectively. That's simple. Note that the subscapularis is the only shoulder girdle muscle which inserts onto the lesser tubercle of humerus. Both of these originate from the upper C5 C6 nerve roots. The lower subscapular nerve additionally supplies the teres major muscle which inserts onto the medial lip of the bicipital groove. The middle subscapular nerve, also called the thoracodorsal nerve, supplies the latissimus dorsi. All these muscles receive posterior division innervation and adduct the shoulder. However, they all internally rotate the shoulder. And yes, the middle subscapular originates from the middle C6, C7, C8 nerve roots. This concludes the 11 side branches and we move on to the 5 terminal branches or the peripheral nerves of the upper limb. Three of these in blue have innervation from the anterior divisions through the lateral and medial cords. They are the musculocutaneous nerve laterally, the median nerve in the middle and the ulnar nerve medially. The remaining two in yellow from the posterior cord with posterior division fibers are the thinner and laterally placed axillary nerve and the thickest of all medially placed radial nerve. We already know this mnemonic MARMU. Let's further see the anterior three MMU terminal branches which are arranged in a characteristic M shape which is very useful in identifying them interoperatively. If you notice carefully, these nerves also have a similar pattern of origin. Musculocutaneous is placed medially and have origin from the upper C5, C6, C7 nerve roots. The median nerve is placed in the middle and have origin from all the nerve roots C5 to T1 while the ulnar nerve is placed laterally and has origin from C8 T1 nerve roots. The additional C7 contribution to the ulnar nerve comes not like this but from the lateral cord and finally through a communicating branch from the lateral root of the median nerve to the ulnar nerve. We will look into some of the interesting aspects of C7 nerve roots and the topographical anatomy of these three anterior terminal branches in a few minutes. Now coming back to the musculocutaneous nerve, it supplies the three anterior compartment muscles of arm which can be remembered by the mnemonic BBC. These are the superficial biceps brachii and the deeper brachialis distally and coracobrachialis proximally. Here's a trivia. A small posterior lateral portion of the brachialis is supplied by the radial nerve. After giving off the branch to brachialis, the terminal portion of the musculocutaneous nerve is cutaneous and it supplies the lateral portion of the forearm. Now moving on to the median nerve. In the arm, it gives off no branches. In the forearm, it supplies all the flexors of the wrist and fingers. Except the one and half ulnar side muscles which are supplied by the ulnar nerve. It also supplies the two pronator muscles. In the hand, the median nerve supplies five muscles which can be remembered by the mnemonic LOAF. Low. It includes the first and second lumbrical muscles and three thinar muscles 
namely the opponent's policies, the AP ductor policies brevis and the flexor policies brevis and not the more ulnarly placed adductor policies. The palmar cutaneous branch given off just proximal to the wrist provides sensory supply to the thinner eminence and the radial half of the palm while the terminal digital branches provide sensation to the entire volar surface and the distal dorsal surface till the DIP of the radial 3 and up fingers. Now moving on to the ulnar nerve, it also doesn't give any branches in the arm. It innervates the flexor carpi ulnaris and the ulnar half of the flexor digitorum profundus that's one and half muscles. In the hand, other than the LOAF structures, the deep terminal branch of the ulnar nerve innervates all the remaining intrinsics including the adductor pollicis and occasionally the deep head of flexor pollicis brevis. The palmar and dorsal cutaneous branches are given off around 5-6 to cm proximal to the ulnar styloid process which supply the respective surface of the ulnar half of the palm while the polar surface of the ulnar one and half fingers are supplied by the terminal superficial or digital branches, their entire dorsal surface is supplied by the same dorsal cutaneous branch. Now, let's get back to the contribution of C7 roots to these three nerves. This will help us correctly identify C7 involvement and also these muscle functions are partially affected when cross C7 is harvested. So, through the musculocutaneous nerve, the C7 contribution is mainly to the coracobrachialis through the median nerve, C7 mainly innervates the FCR, pronator teres and palmaris longus, while through the ulnar nerve, it supplies the FCU along with CAT1. Finally, let's see the topographical anatomy of these three nerves just distilled to the M formation in the upper arm. For the musculocutaneous nerve, the motor fascicles to biceps and brachialis lie laterally or radially, while the sensory fascicle lies medially or ulnarly. For the median nerve, it's the opposite. We know that the lateral root of the median nerve is mainly sensory. So at formation, the sensory fascicle lies laterally while the motor fascicle lies medially. Soon the medial motor fascicle divides into pronator teres and FCR FDS palmaris longus fascicles anteriorly and anteriorous nerve fascicle posteriorly. Note that to pronator teres is the first branch given by the median nerve at elbow followed by FCR FDS PL branches in the forearm while the rest are innervated by the AIN. Moving on to the ulnar nerve, note that the FCU fascicles lie anteriorly and slightly laterally or radially, while the rest are undifferentiated sensory and intrinsic hand motor fibers. Lastly, the terminal two branches of the posterior cord are axillary nerve and the radial nerve. The axillary nerve originates from the upper C5 C6 nerve roots, while the radial nerve, like the median nerve, originates from all the nerve roots. From the axillary nerve, the first posterior branch which also has a pseudoganglion is to teres minor which like its adjacent shoulder girdle muscle, infraspinatus, attaches to the greater tubercle of humerus and helps in external rotation of the shoulder. The rest of the posterior fibers innervate the posterior half of deltoid and also give a sensory branch to the regimental batch area of lateral arm. Its anterior branch innervates the anterior part of deltoid muscle. The anterior part of deltoid flexes and internally rotates, the lateral part abducts and the posterior part extends and externally rotates the shoulder. Finally, the thickest of all, the radial nerve supplies all the posterior compartment muscles which includes all the extensors of elbow, wrist and fingers, the supinator, the brachioradialis, abductor pollicis longus and also a small posterior lateral portion of the brachialis. It also gives off the inferolateral and posterior cutaneous nerve of arm, the posterior cutaneous nerve of forearm and terminal superficial branches which supply the anatomical snuff box area, the radial half of the dorsum of hand and the radial three and half fingers till the DIP joint. Coming to the topographical anatomy of the radial nerve, like the median nerve, the sensory fascicles lie laterally while the motor finger flexors or PIN fascicles lie medially and the wrist flexors that is E, C, R, L and B lie in the middle. Also note that all the five terminal branches also give sensory articular fibers to the adjacent joints they traverse. Oh, that was the entire innervation of the upper limb in a nutshell. So, in this tutorial, we learned about the relations of the various parts of the brachial plexus, the innervations and the resulting functions of the 11 side branches and the 5 terminal branches and also relevant topographical anatomy. For reconstructive purpose, grossly, for shoulder abduction and external rotation, we have to target the suprascapular nerve and axillary nerve branch. 
For elbow flexion, we have to target the musculocutaneous nerve branch. For elbow, wrist and finger extension, we have to target the corresponding branch of the radial nerve. And for wrist and finger flexion and intrinsic function of hand, we have to target the lower trunk which provide motor fibers to both ulnar and median nerve. Here's my illustration of the right brachial plexus from the head end, mainly for reconstructive surgeons. If you stuck on with me for the last 15 minutes, do like the video and subscribe to this channel for more such tutorials. Also, visit us at plaricon.com and let's keep learning plastic surgery together.